The following message was delivered at Westminster Presbyterian on November 5, 2023. The message is based upon Hebrews chapter 6 verses 9 through 20 and it is titled The Unshakable Foundation. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For a people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain, where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And all God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. Our previous two exhortations in the book of Hebrews were difficult. They dealt with weighty and frankly scary subjects. They were calls to action calls to repentance, calls to introspection and evaluation of the state of your own hearts. And most of all, it was a warning against sloth and neglect in the Christian life. But as you can tell from the verse that we just read, it was building to something. The author of Hebrews had a purpose in putting this section in the middle of the book of Hebrews. And I did telegraph this in advance, that what it was building up to was the great hope of the gospel, the great hope that Christians have in Christ. Thus, it is fitting this morning that the first section of the exhortation will deal with the purpose of the warnings. Then we will cover the promise of God and then the place of our hope. Again, that's the purpose of the warnings, the promise of God, and the place of our hope. First, the purpose of the warnings. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. These are encouraging words, and yet don't read more into them than is being said. The author is not saying that everyone in his audience either the original audience of the book of Hebrews or us sitting here today, he is not saying that everyone is saved by God's grace. This is not an apostolic declaration of knowledge of men's eternal states, but rather it is a pastoral encouragement and hope. In contrast with the serious and severe warnings of the previous chapter, here the author expresses his hope that his audience will not make those mistakes that he warned them against. Matthew Henry puts it like this, Ministers must sometimes speak by way of caution to those of whose salvation they have good hopes. And those who have in themselves good hopes as to their eternal salvation should yet consider seriously how fatal a disappointment it would be if they should fall short. Thus, they are to work out their salvation with fear and trembling. This is not 
a discouragement from having an assurance of salvation. Indeed, it is making the point that even if you have a sure and certain assurance of your salvation, you still ought to heed the warnings of Scripture. You still ought to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Think of the words of Paul. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he falls. The author of Hebrews thinks that his audience is standing. The audience of the book of Hebrews thinks that they are standing, but that does not mean that they can set aside those warnings, but must diligently seek to avoid that terrible fate. But we see some of the reason for the author of Hebrews' hope in the salvation of his audience. They were living lives that was that were bearing fruit. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. We won't retread what is what we have just covered in previous exhortations about outward good works. But it is important to point out here that the biblical standard is you shall know them by their fruit. Men who are not saved by grace can do outwardly good works. But men and women who are truly saved by grace are compelled by gratitude to God to do good works, to perform good works publicly before the Lord. They love God so much that they are compelled by that eternal love to serve the church. So while the presence of fruit may not be a guarantee of a person's salvation, the absence of fruit is a damning rebuke. A faith that is confessed with the lips but not lived out with the hands and tongue is a false faith. And so that is why the author of Hebrews feels confident here to point toward the outward good works of this audience in combination with their professed faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, in him as a savior, and trust that that means that they have indeed loved God in their hearts. We desire that each one of you show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Salvation is by grace through faith. Moreover, those who are truly saved by grace cannot fall away from God's grace. They will persevere unto the end. But those truths are not experiential truths. They are revealed truths. To put that slightly differently, the perseverance of the saints is a truth that we know because God has told it to us. It is not a truth that we can easily surmise by looking at our own life experience or at the world around us. What we see with our eyes is men and women who make good starts and then fall away. People who confess faith and live lives of outward godliness for years or even decades and then fall prey to some sin or failing and repent of their former repentance. Who would have looked at the apostles and said, Judas isn't going to make it. But it's not just that we see other people fall away from the faith. It's that we see in our own hearts repeated failures, repeated trials and temptations that even if we don't give in to, we really wanted to. Even though we are growing in grace and being sanctified because God has promised that he will be at work in our hearts and lives, it often doesn't feel that way. We can get discouraged. We can get dejected and nearly abandon all hope that we even can be saved. It is precisely to those tender-hearted believers 
that this encouragement and this warning is intended. Even though salvation is all of grace, we must strive to keep our hearts right with God, our eyes fixed upon his promises, our hope firmly seated in the world to come. Spurgeon puts it like this, keep it up. Be as earnest today as you were 20 years ago when you were baptized and joined the church. Show the same diligence unto the end. John Owen goes even further, saying, By the use of this diligence, grace is increased in us, whereby our evidences of an interest in the promises of the gospel are cleared and strengthened, and herein doth our assurance of hope consist. Owen is pointing out a truth here that not many people today understand or confess. And so I want to repeat just part of it. By the use of this diligence, grace is increased in us. This may seem contradictory to some, but this is actually a point that the scriptures hammer home again and again and again. The necessity of diligent zeal in the believer Paul says in Romans, do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord. In the book of Proverbs, it teaches, the soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing, while the soul of the diligent is richly supplied. Peter writes, therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fail, fall. And Paul writes most strongly in Colossians, Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. Salvation by grace through faith is not an excuse for sloth. Salvation by grace through faith is motivation to live a life of joyful, diligent obedience to the Lord God who saved you on account of no merit of your own. And further, God blesses us by using that very diligence as his means to pour out more blessings upon us. Remember that boy in the Gospels? who had five barley loaves and two fish and fed 5,000? Did that boy feed 5,000 people? No! Jesus used what was an insufficient gift, and he made it sufficient by his mercy and grace. Jesus used that small offering to bless his church. The Lord multiplied something that was utterly insufficient into something that was a blessing for a multitude. And that is exactly and precisely what God does with our weak and plodding efforts after our own sanctification. He takes the widow's might of our diligence and multiplies it and returns a harvest of grace beyond our wildest imagination. The warnings of scripture are meant to encourage us to greater efforts because God desires our whole hearts and minds and souls and bodies in service to him with every breath and every thought. But how do we know that this is worthwhile? How can we be sure that our lives are being poured out for a purpose? Brothers and sisters, we have the promise of God. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and multiply you. Do not be mistaken, brothers and sisters. This promise to Abraham is not some parochial promise that a small tribe would become a slightly larger tribe. This promise was the promise of a savior for the whole world. I will surely bless you 
And I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of the heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. God promised that he would bless Abraham. But he also promised that in that blessing, Abraham would become a blessing to the nations. From him and from his seed would come the Lord Jesus, who would save men from their sins by his life and death and resurrection. It was that promise of a coming Savior that was sealed by the very character of God. It was an oath confirmed by the very nature of God. Put differently, it was not a promise that depended on Abraham. It did not rest on the faithfulness of Isaac or Jacob or Judah or any of Abraham's descendants except for Christ. It would come to pass because God had promised it. Because it was a sure and certain promise, we read, and thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. What God had sworn came to pass. Though, if you recall, Abraham's life was very much like our own. He walked by faith and not by sight. The child of promise, Isaac, was years away, and there were twisted roads and grievous sins in between the receiving of that promise and the initial fulfillment of that promise. And indeed, the ultimate fulfillment of that promise would not come until the birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus and the subsequent proclamation of the gospel to the Gentiles. That would be hundreds of years after the death of Abraham. But he held fast to the promise that he had received. He lived a life marked by repentance and increasing sanctification and trust in the Lord God above. But the central thrust of this passage is not Abraham's faithfulness. The central thrust is God's faithfulness. God wanted to give his people a sure and certain foundation for their hope. And so he delivered the promise and swore by himself to our father Abraham. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and all their disputes and oaths is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. There are things in the Christian life that are not apparent inherently. Things like improving our baptism or meditating on the word of God are utterly foreign to us until we are taught their purpose and their significance. The Lord gives to us to understand and love their purpose. And the same thing is true of this comfort, of this promise from God. Because we do not live in a society that values honesty. <clears throat> Most of us are used to hearing oaths sworn lightly and broken without consequence. The motto of our society is, actions speak louder than words. And then it goes on to place no value on a man's word. And yet we are told here explicitly that the reason that God swore this oath by himself to Abraham was because he desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose. Brothers and sisters in the Lord, the purpose of God has not failed. Even though every man in the world may be a liar, God is not a liar. What he has sworn will come to pass and did come to pass. 
The world around us can serve as both a negative and a positive example. God is our father, for example. And so those of us with good fathers look to our own father and see some pale reflection of God's heavenly love and care for us. But those of us with bad fathers can look to our father and know God is not like this. The same here is true of God's promise. In the new heavens and the new earth to come, no one will break their word. There will be no need to swear by anything because everyone's yeses will be yes and their noes will be no. All mankind will be defined by honesty and trustworthiness. This is not the world that we live in now, but it is the character of God now. We will be like that in the age to come because we will be like him in the age to come. Our character will be like unto his character. Brothers and sisters, there is nothing in this world more sure and certain than the promise of God. Because honesty and truthfulness are inherent in the character of God. He is truth itself. And so when you build your life upon his word and his promises, you can be sure that you are building upon a solid foundation. What he has said will come to pass. It will not change because our God does not change. His word does not change. It stands forever, sure. And because of that, it can be a sure and steadfast anchor for our souls, no matter what generation or decade or century we live in. Which brings us to our final point, the place of our hope. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain, where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The promise of God has come true in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. The seed of Abraham has become a blessing to all the nations, and in him all men can be saved if they would only repent of their sins and confess Christ in their hearts. This fact is undeniable. It is attested not only by God himself, but it is proved by the miracles of the resurrection and ascension, those of which are attested to by countless eyewitnesses and proclaimed to generation after generation of people with fundamentally the same message of gospel salvation by the grace of God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The promise given to Abraham has come to pass, but it also is coming to pass. For the promise of God to Abraham was partially fulfilled with Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, but it will come to full fruition when Jesus Christ returns in power and might and glory to punish sin, to vindicate the righteous, and to make all things right forevermore. That is what the church eagerly longs for, and that future reality is why our souls need a sure and steadfast anchor. Because like Abraham before us, we walk by faith and not by sight. It's true. We have a foretaste of the glory to come. We have access to the Holy Spirit by faith. We know even now that our elder brother, the Lord Jesus Christ, has been raised as the first fruits of the new heavens and the new earth. And in the fellowship of the church, we experience a small portion of that fellowship, love, and camaraderie that will be ours forevermore. But fundamentally, we raise up our voices with the martyrs in heaven and say to the Lord, how long? How long until you come back and fulfill the rest of the promise? So because of that, 
Not only do we need to be warned against sloth and apostasy and encouraged to zeal and faithfulness, we need to be grounded in our faith. We need to be anchored in the faithfulness, zeal, certainty, and joy of the Lord Jesus Christ and his promises. Calvin puts it in a strikingly pastoral way when he speaks of this phrasing, and he says, It is a striking likeness when he compares faith leaning on God's word to an anchor. For doubtless, as long as we sojourn in this world, we stand not on firm ground, but are here tossed and there, as it were, in the midst of a sea, and that indeed a very turbulent sea. For Satan is incessantly stirring up innumerable storms, which would immediately upset and sink our vessel, were not we cast to cast our anchor fast in the deep. For nowhere a haven appears to our eyes. Wherever we look alone, water is in view. Yea, waves also arise and threaten us. But as the anchor is cast through the waters into a dark and unseen place, and while it lies hid there, keeps the vessel beaten by the waves from being overwhelmed, so must our hope be fixed upon an invisible God. We walk by faith and not by sight. We must trust that God will be true to his word, consistent with his character, and that he will bring about the fulfillment of his promises. But this is not blind faith, as it were. This is not an unfounded hope, but a hope located in the throne room of heaven. For it is not just a hope in the promises of God, but a hope in the person of God. Our hope has followed Jesus into the most holy of holies in heaven above, because our hope is not an abstract concept, but a hope rooted in a person, the Savior himself. We look to Jesus and trust in him. And thus, our hope is located wherever Jesus is located. Because Jesus did not live for himself. He did not die for himself. He was not raised up for himself. He did all of those things for us. He did them in advance of us. He paved a way for us to have access with him to God in knowledge and righteousness and holiness. For all the promises of God find their yes and amen in him. Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Jesus is our faithful high priest. And that is not some abstract theological concept. That is a truth meant to be a true comfort to God's people because we can know that our sympathetic high priest has atoned for our sins. He knows what temptations and trials we will suffer in this life and is even now interceding on our behalf. But even more than that, we can know that he is our forerunner. He is now enjoying in the presence of the Father the intimate communion with the Father that will be ours in Christ. On account of the sacrifice that he made, it is possible for the sons and daughters of God to become more like Jesus and to know God the Father. When we look to Christ, we can think not merely, this means that I can be saved, but we can think, I will become like Christ in knowledge and righteousness and holiness. What more sure and certain hope could there be to base your life upon. God has sworn, and he will do it. What greater motivation is there to faithfulness and zeal? The creator who made all things has revealed exactly what it is he desires from you. And moreover, he has promised to bless you and to be with you through the trials of it. What could be more beautiful than our Savior in heaven above, praying for us and waiting for us 
and holding for us the full fulfillment of all the promises of God's people. Brothers and sisters, look to Jesus. Hope in Jesus. Trust in Jesus. There is nothing in all of creation more sure and more certain. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the inexpressible gifts of salvation, for the incredible privilege of coming before you, cloaked in the righteousness of Christ, righteousness that we did not earn and could never earn, and yet you have graciously showered upon us. Father, we pray that we would grow in grace, that we would make steady progress towards the new heavens and the new earth, and that you would never abandon us or forsake us. Father, we pray that you would be true to your character, that you would bless your people this week, and that you would gather us safely home. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. For more messages like the one you just heard, visit Westminster Presbyterian online or in person at westminsterbartlesville.org or in person at the corner of Adams and Chickasaw in Bartlesville, Oklahoma. We meet every Lord's Day at 10.30 in the morning and 5 p.m. in the evening. We'd be glad to have you.